Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Continuing our series on early Buddhist history, today I'm going to speak about the reign of King Asoka and particularly the Third Council. So this is a very important episode in the history of Buddhism. King Asoka was a very important figure. Unfortunately, we don't have good unimpeachable sources on the life of King Asoka. There are three main sources, and they don't agree with each other very much. We have, first of all, the, the uh, edicts of King Asoka that he had carved into rocks and pillars all over India, which uh, announce some of his policies and his uh, ideas to the general public. It was kind of the, uh, the Twitter of the day. And we have the um, Sri Lankan Chronicles, and particularly the Mahawangsa, written in Pali in Sri Lanka several centuries later. And the main interest in the Mahawangsa is the origin and spread of Theravada Buddhism on that island. But in that regard, it necessarily includes some account of King Asoka and the Third Council, which is quite critical formative episode in that history. The third major source is a text written in Sanskrit called the Asoka Vedana, and it's probably, although we're not certain of this, it's probably a text of the Sarvastivadins, and that has a, a very colorful account of King Asoka's life and career. Besides these, there are numerous episodes and short stories about uh, Asoka that crop up in Buddhist literature over the centuries. He became something of a, a figure of myth and legend. So, to begin with what we know about King Asoka and his place in Indian history, at the time of the Buddha, as uh, discussed in the, the first lecture in this series, at the time of the Buddha, northern India was divided into many small kingdoms and republics. Traditionally, they're listed as 16 Janapadas, but there were probably more. But already in the Buddha's lifetime, there was a beginning of a consolidation as the more powerful states began to absorb the less powerful, weaker, smaller ones. Eventually, the power in northern India became centralized in the, the uh, kingdom of Magadha. And the capital was at that time, Pataliputra. And this was first ruled by the Nanda dynasty. But then a figure called uh, Chandragupta Maurya seized power. He was a, a general in Nanda's employ. And he seized power and established a new dynasty. And this is the, the Mauryan dynasty. And this is the dynasty of which Ahsoka was the uh, most famous ruler. 
But Chandragupta was quite important in his own right, and he's the one who conquered the rest of northern India, and he fought against the armies of Alexander the Great. He was a contemporary of Alexander the Great, and some accounts say that they met. Chandragupta was a Jain, or he converted to Jainism at some point, and he, he actually ended his life in a very Jain manner. He abdicated the throne, gave the power to his son, Bindusara, and became a Jain ascetic. And when uh, at the end of his, his life, when he was quite old, he uh, committed the ritual suicide in the Jain manner by starving himself to death. The Jains believe that making any karma is bad and the best action is no action. So if you just do nothing, including not eating, you're doing the best thing in, in the Jain idea. His son Bindusara was an Ajivaka. So none of these early kings were Orthodox Hindus. Asoka was the son of Bindusara and the grandson of Chandragupta. And as we know, and it's very important for our history, he, at some point during his reign, he converted to Buddhism. And the accounts of his conversion are different in all our three principal sources. It does appear that before his conversion, uh, he was quite ruthless and bloodthirsty. Uh, he's given the name in the um, Ahsoka Vadna as Chandasoka, Ahsoka the Fierce, before his conversion, and after he became Dhammasoka, Ahsoka of the, the Dhamma. In um, the uh, Mahavangsa, the Sri Lankan Chronicle, it's said that uh, he was one of a hundred sons of Bindusara, and he, <clears throat> he killed the other 99 to seize the throne. While we can make some allowance for Indian proclivity to exaggerate numbers, it's quite possible that uh, Bindusara, as an Indian Maharaja, had many, many sons because he had many, many wives. So it was quite, quite within the realm of possibility that he had dozens of sons. In the um, Ahsoka Vedana, to establish the ferocity of Ahsoka, an episode is recounted where he was relaxing in his pleasure garden with a hundred of his concubines, and he uh, fell asleep underneath an Ahsoka tree. And there's a type of tree with uh, pretty blossoms that's called the Ahsoka tree. And his concubines, when he was asleep, they were unhappy with him because apparently he was very rough and his, he had unpleasant rough skin, as the text says. So they, in their peevishness, they chopped all the branches off the Ahsoka tree because it has the same name as him. And when he woke up and see what they had done, he flew into a rage and he had them all burned alive as punishment. He uh, also, in the same, from the same source, it said that he would uh, often kill people with his own hand, with his sword, um, meeting out his rough justice. And one of his ministers told him, king, it's not proper for the king to do his own killing. You should find an executioner. So, and this story leads into his conversion. This is the Ahsoka Vedana version, and it's much more elaborate than the other versions. And um, he went, uh, uh, he had his minister go and search the country for someone who could be cruel enough. And in 
in some village, they found a man who we would call today, we would call a psychopath or a sociopath. His greatest delight was catching small animals and torturing them. And all the other villagers were scared of him. And uh, this minister thought, this fellow is perfect. He's, he'll, he'll make a good executioner for, for Ahsoka. So the fellow agreed, but then the minister says, according to law, you, you're, you're still young. You have to get the permission of your parents. So he went home to ask his mother and father, and they didn't want him to leave, so we killed them. And the minister took him to Ahsoka, and on the way they stopped at a Buddhist monastery for a rest, and the monk there was giving a sermon on the Balapandita Sutta of the Majjhima Nikaya, which is the one which describes in detail all the tortures of hell, the cutting and the burning and slashing and all these horrible tortures. And this fellow was just delighted. He says, what a lot of good ideas in this sutta. So what he did under the aegis of uh, the king, he built a jail that was called the beautiful jail because from the outside it was all pleasant gardens and beautiful architecture, but inside it was hell on earth. Literally, he copied everything he could from the Buddhist hells, boiling copper kettles and swords and nails and every kind of torture possible. And he had the agreement of King Ahsoka that the rule would be any... Anyone who enters that jail cannot come out again. So many people were tortured to death in that jail. But there was a novice monk, a Samanera, who in the um, Ahsoka Vedana is named as Samudra, who was already an Arahant. And he was wandering on his arms around, and he went up to this jail, the, the beautiful outside. He didn't know what it was, and he walked inside. And so this fellow says, okay, you're caught now. You're going to, uh, you're going to uh, suffer the tortures of hell. And he put him in the cauldron of boiling oil, but it didn't burn him. It was just like cool water. So the jailer was alarmed. He didn't know what to make of this. So he sent for the king, and the king Ahsoka came to inquire what's going on here and uh, the novice levitated up into the air and preached a sermon on the Dhamma and the uh, the king was then turned in the heart and realized he'd been doing wrong and he had to have more compassion for sentient beings and became a follower of the Buddha and the novice with his powers he was able to just leave he just flew out the door and the king went to leave, but the jailer says, Your Majesty, I, I hate to tell you this, but the rule here is no one leaves. And the king said, Well, who came into this jail first, you or me? And the guy, Well, I was here first. I, I built the place. So, okay, well, you stay here. <laughs> and, the, and Ahsoka had him put to death and he tore the jail down. So that's a very uh, elaborate and colorful story of Ahsoka's conversion. And the whole Ahsoka Vedana is like that. It's full of these miraculous events and elaborate stories. In the um, Mahavangsa, it's much simpler. It also involves an enlightened novice here named Nagroda. And we find this between these two texts, that there's often parallel stories, but the characters have different names. And the novice Nagroda came to the, the king's palace. The king saw him outside and was impressed by his demeanor and asked him to come in. And he told the novice, please, sir, take the most suitable seat. And the novice looked around the hall and thought the most suitable seat for himself was the king's throne. And he sat on the king's throne. And this the, the boldness of that impressed King Ahsoka. And King Ahsoka bowed to the novice, and the novice 
taught him the Dhamma and he became converted. This is uh, symbolic of the um, the rule in Buddhist countries is that uh, even the king bows to, to the monks. This is uh, still done today in Thailand. The king will bow to, to bhikkhus. The most likely account is actually from the pillar edicts because this is in Ahsoka's own words. The empire he inherited from his father, Bindusara, covered most of India, in fact, most of the subcontinent, you know, the greater India. So it would include, in today's uh, geography, it would include Pakistan, probably most of Afghanistan, Bangladesh, you know, the whole subcontinental region it was a huge empire, but they hadn't yet conquered the south, the very southern part of India. And Ahsoka wanted to complete the, the, the uh, empire, and he launched a war against the Kalinga kingdom, which was the uh, one of two and uh, the more important of the two kingdoms in the southern tip. He conquered Kalinga, but then uh, was appalled by the slaughter. It said that uh, 100,000 people on both sides died in the, in the very bloody war. And he uh, then heard Buddhist preaching about respect for life and non-harming, and he uh, felt uh, remorse at having caused this great slaughter, and he converted to Buddhism. So what we have common in all three stories, or all three versions, is that before his conversion, Ahsoka was a fierce king, and then he somehow his heart was moved and he became a Buddhist, and he devoted his reign to promoting Buddhist principles. In the pillar edicts, many of them admonitions towards non-harming, and he's probably the first ruler of any state in history who actually extended protection to animals. He, for example, uh, limited, he didn't completely uh, go vegetarian in his court, but he limited greatly the number of animals killed, reduced it by a, a huge factor. And he banned hunting for sport, although hunting for meat was still allowed. And some species of animals he protected, uh, banned their killing altogether. It's possible that he also, and this would have been also a first time ever, uh, he uh, might have banned capital punishment or eliminated, abolished capital punishment. Uh, this is uncertain because uh, the language used in that particular pillar is in an obscure dialect and there are different interpretations of it. As these pillar edicts were in many different languages, he was trying to reach everyone in, the, in this vast empire with many different groups and languages. Some of them were even in Greek. So he became a devout Buddhist. This is clear from the Pillar Edicts. One important uh, program of King Asoka that is mentioned in both the Asoka Vedana and in the Mahavangsa is the building of stupas. At the time of the Buddhist Parinibbana, all the various kings and powers of India at the time almost came to war over his relics. And this was settled by agreement. There was a Brahmin named Drona who agreed to make a division of the relics into eight for the eight kings and powers. Some of them were Republican powers that 
claimed a share of the, the relics. So he divided the relics. So these were called the Drona relics, and each king built a stupa. So there were eight stupas with uh, one-eighth of the relics of the Buddha. But um, they were all of geographically fair, relatively close to each other. They were in the, the Majima Padesa in the you know, central Ganges Valley. But Ahsoka ruled a vast empire, and he wanted to share the benefits of the Dhamma and give the um, people in every corner of his empire the chance to circumambulate a stupa, which was a pretty major religious practice at the time. So traditionally, he's said to have built 84,000 stupas. He broke up the old drona stupas and subdivided the relics into much smaller portions and put them in these 84,000 stupas. We have to be a bit suspicious of the number 84,000. It's a, um, a number that occurs often in ancient Indian texts, meaning you know, a large number. But certainly he built many, many stupas around the country. There's one episode that's recounted in commentary to the Digha Nikaya. It's one of these scattered stories about Ahsoka that when he went to break up the stupa of King Ajatasattu, the king of Magadha, it was protected by a mechanical sword wheel. King Ajatasattu had had built this some kind of uh, booby trap so anybody who tried to break the stupa would get torn up with these swords. And uh, King Ahsoka was unable to approach, and these swords would start whirling. But then the, the god, uh, uh, Wesakama, the um, architect of the, the gods, the Dewas, from Tawatinksa heaven, appeared, and he shot an arrow into the middle of the, uh, the sword wheel and broke it. And a voice cried out from inside the stupa, Enter, wretched king. And uh, Ahsoka was insulted and couldn't understand why, why he was being called wretched. And the story doesn't explain it either. It just it sort of leaves it as a curiosity. Could be another... Another reference to something a little bit unpleasant about Ahsoka. We have the Ahsoka Vedana and that story about the concubines not liking him because he had rough skin. And there's a an origin for that is given as it's quite a charming story in its own way, that in a previous life, at the time of the Buddha, the Buddha was on alms round in, in Rajagaha. And there was a young boy playing in the mud, making you know, mud pies. And uh, when the Buddha came down the street with Ananda, this boy was overcome with faith in the Buddha, and he wanted to make an offering, but he was just a poor street child. He had nothing to give. So he made a little ball of mud and put it in the Buddha's bowl. And... Ananda was upset by this, you know, how you're putting mud in the Buddha's bowl. And the Buddha say not so, Ananda, say not so. That handful of mud will become the whole of Jampudipa, you know, the, you know, the whole of India or the whole world. So it said that because he gave this offering to the Buddha, then he became the emperor of India. But because he put something foul in the Buddha's bowl, he was born with rough skin. So it's an act of mixed karma. And Ahsoka, by ruling all of Jampudipa, sometimes he's called the uh, Chakawati of one continent. Chakawati is a world ruler, rules all four continents. And one of them is Jampudipa, which is uh, roughly equivalent to India. 
So this would give him not only a royal status, but a kind of mythical or cosmological status. Now, the important, um, the most important event in terms of Buddhist history that we need to deal with is the Third Council. Now, there are some modern scholars who doubt the veracity of the Third Council because it's only mentioned in the Sri Lankan sources. It's not mentioned at all in the Asoka Vedana. But that doesn't really seem a convincing reason to reject it. The Asoka Vedana is quite full of fabulous events. It's not really a sober history. While the Mahawangsa does have some miraculous events, it's generally more sober and it's uh, focused on the history of, of Buddhism and how it come into Sri Lanka. The um, beginning of the idea of the Third Council was that King Asoka had been so generous to the Sangha and founded so many monasteries and offered so much food and other requisites, cloth and everything needful, that many unscrupulous individuals were pretending to be monks to get free f food and lodging. Well, they put on a robe and show up and get fed. And it said that uh, there was a a crisis or, uh, began to occur when the proper monks were uncertain who was a monk and who wasn't. And it's part of the vinya that if the monks hold a sangha kama, like a, a, a patimoka or an uh, upasampada ceremony, and there are improper or non-monks participating, it invalidates the, the action. So the monks just refuse, the, the proper monks, they just refuse to hold any ceremony, any of these sangha kamas, like ordinations or the uh, bi-monthly patimoka, recitation of the rules. They just refuse to do them. And it said that seven years went by with no uh, sangha kama being performed. So this was a crisis in the Sangha. And the story in the Deepawangsa then has uh, an incident where Asoka tried, his first attempt to solve the crisis was he sent a minister to um, one of the big chief monasteries and told them to order the monks to hold a, a, an Oposita ceremony. And the monks refused. So this minister, not sure what to do, in his kind of rough-handed way, he started just killing monks. He started slicing their heads off with a sword. And he killed a few that way. And the king's younger brother, Tisa, was one of the monks there. And he uh, saw what was happening, and he ran to the front of the line and sat down to be the next one to give his head chopped off which stopped the minister because the minister knew who he was. So it stopped the minister. He wouldn't do it. And he ran back to the king and told him what had happened. And, and Osoka was very upset. He didn't, he didn't intend for the, there to be any violence. And he realized he had to do something else. So he consulted the elder Mogali Putatissa, who was described in the the text as being very um, learned and wise and also having uh, supernormal powers. His origin is said that he actually descended from the Brahma world. He was a Brahma god and the other gods begged him to take birth on the earth because there's a crisis in the Dhamma. So he was reborn in, into the human realm and was to fulfill this role. 
but he was probably the chief Buddhist advisor of the king. And he told the king what they need to do is to hold a council and purge the heretic monks and the false monks and just disrobe them. So they held a big council and it said that uh, Asoka and Mogalipatissa sat together and the monks were interviewed. It said that 60,000 good monks and 60,000 bad monks were interviewed. And again, this could be an exaggeration of numbers. It seems like unwieldy to interview them one by one. It seems impossible. But it may be they were interviewing groups. But um, King Asoka had asked Mogali Putatissa before this began, he asked, what did the Buddha teach? And Mogali Putatissa answered him with, with a one word as the simplest uh, definition. He said, the Buddha taught Ubhajawada. So this becomes a very important term and there's some controversy in the scholarly circles about exactly what it entails, but the, the, the meaning of the word vibhajja is something like analysis or discrimination or um, precise classification. So when the, the monks were brought up before the the, the king and, and this elder monk, they were asked one by one, what did the Buddha teach? And if they had any wrong views, if what they claimed the Buddha taught was not actually in accord with what the Buddha taught, then they were ordered to be disrobed and thrown out of the Sangha. And the monks that were left were called Vibhajavadins. And the Vibhajavadins, according to the Sri Lankan account, these are the, the beginnings of the Theravada. They're the continuation of the Staviravada main line. And they be, they're called Vibhajavadins, or the school of analysis. And they were the ones judged at the Third Council to be orthodox. It's also thought by many, um, many of the scholars who've looked at this period that whether it happened at the Third Council or not, this is roughly the time when there was the split between the Vibhajavadins and the Sarvastavadins. The Staviravada root split into these two branches at that time. And it may be that the largest group that was excluded from the Orthodox Sangha at the time were Savastavadins. And this makes some sense doctrinally because of the Sarvastavadin view that past, present, and future are all the same. They all exist. Whereas the Orthodox opinion was, no, we have to discriminate between past, present, and future. So we bhajavada. We have to make the distinction between past, present, and future. They're not the same. So we bhajavada sounds like the name was specifically chosen to distinguish themselves from the Sarvastavadins, the all-exist school. So going forward from that time, we have these two main branches of the of the old Staviravada, the Vibhajavadins and the Sarvastavadins. And according to the Sri Lankan account, at least, the Vibhajavadins were the ones who were judged orthodox by King Asoka and the Third Council. There are other episodes subsequent to that that were that were a part of the 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 story of king asoka one of the most important probably the most important after the third council on the building of the stupas was the sending of missionaries to many foreign countries 
in all directions. And I'll, I'll talk about that a bit more in the next installment when I want to talk about the coming of Buddhism and Theravada to Sri Lanka. But there was also the um, promotion of devotion to the Bodhi tree. This was a very important theme that King Asoka was the first ruler to really make a, a special... Uh, holy place out of the Bodhi tree. And the Ahsoka Vedana has another one of its colorful stories. One of the king's principal wives, his favorite, was uh, Tisya Raksita. And she was kind of haughty, jealous woman. And she heard that the king was sending all this gold and... Um, fine things and perfumes to Bodhi to make this shrine around the Bodhi tree. And she thought Bodhi was another woman. She just heard this name Bodhi and she didn't know it was a tree. She thought it was a woman and she became very jealous. And she hired a sorcerer to go and poison Bodhi. So this uh, it was a Batanga woman uh, who then went to the Bodhi tree and put some poison in by the roots and the tree started to wither. And then the king was upset and of course he was distraught and the word got back to this queen what had happened and she realized her mistake and she uh, ordered the sorcerers to reverse the spell and, and heal the tree, which she did. Finally, at the very end of... Ahsoka's life, when he was old and ill, he had a, apparently, a, and various accounts agree on this, that he had a prolonged illness at the end of his life. He didn't go suddenly. And his son uh, began to take over the rulership of the kingdom, kind of uh, unofficially, and tried to rein in the excess of King Ahsoka's spending. King Ahsoka kept sending all the wealth to the to the monasteries to the extent that he was ruining the, the treasury. And they cut Ahsoka off from the ability to spend the royal funds. And Ahsoka started giving away his own personal adornments and things until they all ran out. And then at the very end, just before he died, it said he'd given everything away and all he had left was a half a mirobellum, which is a kind of a small bitter fruit. I know he probably had been given some as medicine and he ate half and he gave the other half to the, to the Sangha. And the, um, the monks had it ground up very small and mixed in with, with gruel and distributed amongst all the monks in the, in the monastery. And from ruling the entire earth to his wealth was diminished to half a mirabellum at the end. So when ah Ahsoka passed away, the power passed to his son, and it continued in the Mauryan dynasty for another 50 years. And uh, gradually it diminished. There was a series of, of weak kings, and the the... Um, Mauryan dynasty eventually died out and was replaced by other powers in India. And there was no more Mauryan empire. But that was definitely King Asoka's reign was definitely the high point of Buddhist India when Buddhism was the official official state religion of India. And when it began to spread in a major way outside of India with the missionaries that he sent in all directions, including to the Greek kingdoms in the West. The Mauryans, beginning with Chandragupta, the Mauryans always had relations, diplomatic relations with the Greeks. So they had Greek kingdoms established fairly close nearby after the conquests of uh, Alexander. So these two civilizations were in uh, 
intercourse, sometimes friendly trade and diplomacy and sometimes war, but they were definitely uh, interacting with each other from the time of Chandragupta onward. And we do start to see some Indian influence in, in, uh, in the Greek world after this time. So this is uh, a bit of a, uh, an account of the reign of King Ahsoka. And to summarize, what we know about King Ahsoka for sure is that he was a very powerful Indian ruler, probably the largest Indian empire ever, even greater in extent than British India because he had Afghanistan. He was a very powerful Buddhist, very devout Buddhist ruler, built many stupas and distributed the relics, and all Buddha relics in the world today are, come from these Ahsoka stupas. And uh, he sent missionaries out proselytizing all the other countries. And it seems very likely that there was a third council that was held under the ages of King Ahsoka, but we have to be a little cautious here because it's only in the Sri Lankan literature that we have an account of the third council. And during his reign, probably at or shortly after the third council, there was the split between the Vibhajavadins and the Sarvastavadins. So... That's King Ahsoka.